I know that a martial artist from anywhere in the world will have more in common with me than most people, even from my own country. Hello, you're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 596, with my guest today, Mr. Matt Hoffman. I am Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, founder of Whistlekick, and a passionate traditional martial artist, which is why everything we do in Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what we do, what that means, go to whistlekick.com. That's the place you're going to find out everything, all the projects and the products. And if you find something in our store, which is one of the ways that we fund all this work that we're doing, you can use the code PODCAST15, saves you 15%, lets us know that people who listen to the podcast buy stuff. It's an important thing to know in business. This show has its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you two brand new episodes each and every week. And our goal here at Whistlekick and on Martial Arts Radio, well, it's all under the heading of connecting, educating, and entertaining the traditional martial artists of the world. If the work that we do means something to you and you want to support it, you have a number of ways that you can help us out. You can make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media. If you're not, you're crazy. You could tell friends about us. That's one of the biggest ways that we grow. You could pick up a book on Amazon. we got a bunch of titles. You could leave a review on iTunes or Spotify or Facebook or Google. Or you could support our Patreon. Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Whistlekick. Patreon's a place where we post exclusive content. And if you contribute as little as five bucks a month, you're going to get access to exclusive audio. You could actually do two bucks a month and just get the behind the scenes content. $10 a month, you get video. In fact, today, I just did a brand new video on crafting, using, and the importance of understanding impromptu weapons. How do you take what you do with a bow or a staff, whatever you call it, out to a stick that you find laying on the ground? I go over some of that. Our content on Patreon, it's meant to give you even more, to help you go deeper, or to just get more of the stuff that we do that you like. You know. Every guest that I talk to has a different story. They say different things. They come from a different place. And that makes sense because we're all different with different experiences. And today's guest wanted to go deeper, wanted to talk philosophy, wanted to talk about some of the more mental, emotional, personal development components of martial arts. And those of you who've been listening a while know I was quite happy to go there. And that's where my conversation with Mr. Hoffman met. So let's get to it. Hey, Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's uh, yeah, really good to be with you. Yeah, I appreciate having you on. You, you mentioned a few minutes ago that because of the way the world is right now, that you haven't had the opportunity to talk about martial arts with very many people. And I can understand the pain of that. I can't relate to it because of this show. And I am blessed. I get to talk to people all the time about martial arts and call it my job. It's pretty sweet. Yeah, I can imagine that. Probably on some days is a little bit of a blessing and some days a little bit of a curse. <laughs> it's rarely a curse. I'll, yep, I'll, right I'll confess. You <laughs> nine, nine, more than nine times out of ten. Yeah, I am I sure. am pumped to do it. Sweet. Yeah. And you know, in terms of yeah, for me, COVID has been a really interesting exploration of kind of solitude and silence in an interesting mm-hmm. way. So this when I got the opportunity to come on and join y'all, it felt like a really great kind of meditation on, you know, what's, uh, what's stuck around and maybe what's survived the silence. Mm, that's, a, that's a great way to frame it. Yeah, so many people, our training has changed. Whether right. it's just moving yes. from the things that we did in a group live, move to mm. doing them online as a group, mm. to more extreme things where, so many schools unfortunately went under and people are looking for different ways to train just to keep going. I know my training has changed dramatically. You know, it's, it's, Mm -hmm. it's self-driven from home. Yeah. Yeah. I totally hear that. I mean, you know, and for me, you know, as the way I've trained has largely been self-driven since I was kind of in my, my late teens, you know, in terms of I've always had schools that I've trained at or with, but I was, uh, became a bit of a nomad after high school, traveled around, uh, you know, to various different teachers and places. And so, you know, the solo practice really always was at the heart of it. And I think there's something about traditional martial arts that has always really been 
about solo practice. Mm. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. And I, I think in a lot of, in a lot of ways, hopefully what I will talk about today with y'all is, is kind of why I think that is and why if you study like the various historical periods that martial arts had to survive through, you know, COVID's nothing in comparison. Sure. That was an interesting word choice. Nomad. I don't know that we <laughs> use that word on this show. You know, it's not too often we're oh, going to really? have a new word pop up, but the idea of being a, a martial arts nomad, I mean, it evokes yeah. some pretty strong imagery and, and, you know, let's, let's get into the, the before, but before we get to the before, let's unpack that. You know, what do you mean yeah. when in your late teens you were a nomad? Yeah, that's a great question. So I was, you know, just to give a little bit of context, I started studying martial arts you know, as much as anyone can study martial arts as a kid at uh, four or five. And I kind of just became obsessed with it as a field of study more than any one particular system. And I was really lucky to be, you know, kind of blessed with uh, an obsession also for history. Um, And so because of that, my, you know, kind of reading and research uh, led me to Asia in particular, as I think a lot of traditional martial artists find themselves gravitating toward Asia, um, you know, studied, I was lucky enough to be sent over by one of my karate teachers to practice in Japan when I was 15. And then that really kind of gave me the bug, the travel bug. And uh, when I was 19, I you know, kind of saved up a bunch of money and went over to study Shaolin in China and uh, became really, really interested in, like a, in, in a really wide um, you know, kind of survey of the martial arts. And I was really interested in tracking them to their source as much as I possibly could which led me down some very strange avenues, um, which lent itself really well to someone such as myself with, uh, yeah, we'll say like nomadic tendencies. Um, yeah, you know, and there was always a returning back to, I'm, I'm in the Merrimack Valley uh, region of, of Northern Massachusetts. And uh, so there was always like a going and a coming back, a going and a coming back. And, um, and that, yeah, kind of that nomadic tendency for me really just became one of the great joys of my life. Um, going to see things, not just, uh, you know, on a screen, but where they're from and the feelings, the cultures, the languages, the food, the, um, you know, the flavor of the world that they actually emerged from. Hmm. You know, that's what that really means to me. And I guess, you know, just one final thing. I, you know, grew up, I was born in 1985. I grew up in the age, kind of the golden age of like cinema. Um, but I was, you know, I was always really obsessed with like martial arts movies and action movies and adventure movies and fantasy movies. And so that, you know, that image of the, the nomadic uh, martial artist was always really emblazoned in my mind from a young age. So maybe that had something to do with it, I'm sure. I, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're yeah. The, the story that you're, starting to tell here really could be the story of a lot of old kung fu flicks you know learning and wandering and being sent away and and yet mm-hmm. coming back home and there's this this sense that I'm, I'm taking of you being very experimental in things and you know i'm not i'm not tying that to any one thing whether it's martial arts or non-martial arts or whatever you know there's there's no agenda in my use of that word mm-hmm. no. but i get i get yeah. the sense that you you say yes a lot. Oh, I'm going to go try this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to see what that is. And having that, that foundation of Northern Massachusetts and, and I, and I know that area, we're not that far away. I'm in Vermont, Yeah, but knowing that area, you know, knowing, you know, you're, you, it seems like you, you have this interesting dichotomy, this ability to, to go off, to Mm. be nomadic and yet know that at some point, if you want to need to recharge, you mm-hmm. can come back. And mm-hmm. it, it sounds kind of like the best of both worlds. Yeah, I, I you know, I feel uh, a lot of gratitude for that. Um, you know, I come from 
so, you know, my kind of family background is of Sicilian immigrants who, you know, immigrated here, not necessarily by choice, but by necessity to the U.S. about a hundred and you know, some odd years ago, 100, 115 years ago, to Lawrence, Massachusetts, where I am kind of right now um, and worked in the mills uh, just as a, as a function of necessity. And I think, you know, kind of growing up with that, you know, big family Sicilian, you know, kind of hospitality underneath maybe a work ethic that is always interested in trying to keep pushing um, has always given me like a great opportunity to push the boundaries of what felt like was being presented to me um, and, and try to find what was underneath it all. Um, and then, yeah, I, you know, I was, I was really lucky to kind of be given a lot of free reign. You know, I grew up doing martial arts in the dojo, of course, but actually most of my young experiences, especially in my teen years, were actually running off into the woods and training, you know, in, on, you know, kind of now defunct land that my family had farmed at one point, you know, it was like, a I always have had this sense of family underneath this sense of exploration. And yeah, I mean, you know, I, I would never have been able to arrive at this point. Um, and I think most martial artists will say this, you know, without, you know, the influence of various family members and various, you know, kind of factors that allowed for my exploration. So a lot of gratitude there. Nice. Now you mentioned starting pretty early, four or five years old. Yeah, you were yeah. born in eighty five, so we're we're coming in after the the peak from Karate Kid, but a little bit before the peak in Ninja Turtles timeline. <laughs> it was an interesting yeah, yeah. time in that you started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what what were the circumstances? Why'd you get started? Yeah, you know, it's so funny. My parents actually had to convince me to take lessons um, because I was watching. I remember it was I was watching the Karate Kid a lot. Um, and I don't, you know, watching it now, I could not have as a child been aware of the context of the story that I was watching ultimately, you know. Um, but I would just go around the house practicing the kicks and the punches and all that sort of stuff. And um, I was also a really shy young man. I still, in many ways, am very shy, um, though I have, for various reasons, learned to be extroverted in my presentation. Um, that, you know, I, I really, yeah, just was like nervous about going in and taking classes, but my mom was able to get me, uh, you know, to go to a school um, studying uh, or starting with uh, Weichiru Karate. And, um, that style has kind of tracked me, you know, for the entire time, you know, for the last mm. 30 or so years, I still teach and practice Weichiru with, uh, various friends. And I actually am right now having the honor of teaching my romantic partner, um, some of the beginning kata of that, that karate system. And, uh, yeah, you know, and then, from there, I, you know, kind of the rest became history. Of course, like all young people, there's like, I don't want to. Um, but it was always the thing that was there. It was always the the thing that I was doing. Um, none of, you know, no other sports really drew me into like uh, an immersive awareness. Though I will say, um, I have always been kind of an endurance athlete as well, running. Uh, as any good fighter of any framework will tell you, road work is one of the most important things you can do. And so, uh, you know, running long distances has kind of interestingly kind of tracked along with martial arts. And my mom, like, uh, you know, kind of similarly to getting into martial arts, you know, was a dancer, a yoga practitioner, a runner. And so I grew up around those disciplines and they all really influenced my early development and my yearning to kind of understand more and more about what was going on underneath the surface. So okay. yeah, I was really, I was really lucky. And as you say, you know, the pop culture of the time, uh, you know, the other thing that always tracked for me was uh, Japanese anime. 
was really becoming popularized in the in the West around that period of time. Mm-hmm. So of course there's Karate Kid, of course there's Ninja Turtles, but uh, very very early on, like early Dragon Ball, and uh, there was this really weird show I think called like Monkey Magic, which is based on uh, the Stone Monkey mythology. For some reason, I you know I like I for some reason had that show like kind of track in my early childhood in a way that really. Uh, I think probably influenced my interest and care in uh, cultural mythology from other parts of the world. That really has influenced my mm. my study. It's interesting. We have a, had quite a few guests on the show mm. who find some kind of resonance with the culture, the, the country of origin of mm. the art I, that they study. And, mm. you know, I've, I've got some of that, but not nearly at the depth that it sounds like you have and, and certainly not as deep as some of the other guests that we've had on the show. You mentioned earlier that you made it to Japan at one point at 15, mm-hmm. sent by your instructor, I think is what you said. So w- yeah. w- was that a continuation of that interest in the culture? Yes, very much so. Very much so. Um, you know, I think, you know, I wore my first gi when I was, <clears throat> when I was four. Um, and so because of that, you know, the bowing and the Japanese lessons and the ritual of it all really became, you know, in this very evocative way, really uh, centralized in my awareness. And it always alluded to a lot more underneath it. And, you know, flash forward to 25 years later, when I'm, uh, you know, kind of working as I'm running through what's what would be commonly referred to as an uchideshi program with one of my teachers in my late twenties. Um, there was a, a heavy focus on where all of the elements of the ritual are actually coming from, and so you know this this element of, of ritual and why the rituals are done what they are done the way they are and the way that the cultures themselves are actually encoded into the arts, um, you know, is so interesting. And also, I, I have to say, as a student of history, I now understand so insidious, right? Because there is a truth to why there is a necessity to encode culture within ritual. Um, so that, you know, uh, we can't really necessarily remove the arts that we're practicing from the cultures we're practicing them in. And as an American, I found something just so, so interesting about that. And it has really, you know, whether the right word is haunting or, uh, you know, just it intrigued me enough to, to really lead me down the roads to kind of go deeper. Um, it's, it, yeah, uh, really, really early on, there was a, a deep interest in the cultures um, that, that all of this emerged from. And, you know, I guess I'll say very specifically because I can't, uh, I guess I want us to go there in our conversation. Um, I don't feel that, this conversation can or should be removed from a lot of conversation in the United States right now around things like cultural appropriation, around things like, um, you know, kind of equality and justice across these different cultural lines. And that sense of justice has really kind of, um, you know, as that martial arts nomad, you know, kind of ideal has really permeated my practice always really been there at the heart of it is like how does martial arts actually assist us in bringing out uh, bringing about a more just world and i i felt that there was something underneath what i was looking at as a kid that was all about making a better world and uh and i i, I in the bow right gichin funakoshi um you know to track karate all the way back karate begins and ends with great right? Wow. Respect always. And so, yeah, that's really always been at the heart of why I wanted to understand more, Um, of course, from my personal curiosity, but so that I could deeply respect um, and care for the cultures that were able to to kind of bring me this um, knowledge. 
Wow. There's a lot there. There is. I apologize. Yeah, totally. No, no, definitely don't <laughs> apologize. This is good stuff. Yeah, totally. Cool. You've used some very intentional language. You talked about going deeper. I, and I'm getting the sense that you were aware of, let's call it the the non physical, non combative aspects of martial arts mm. earlier than maybe some others might have been. You know, am, am I am I reading that right? I'm I'm gonna guess 12, 13, somewhere in there, you started saying, huh, there's more to this stuff than the punching and kicking. Yeah, yeah. Well, and this is this is probably where my path diverges, as you say, from a lot of other folks who are were my peers at the time. Um, you know, probably for you know, a strange number of reasons. I, you know, I found my way from karate and then uh, my best friend at the time was studying with this Kempo practitioner, like an American Kempo practitioner. Uh, And, you know, Ed Parker Kempo, you know, coming out of Hawaii in some ways is like one of the early, uh, you know, kind of predecessors to what we now kind of can clearly understand is like a mixed martial arts model, right? There's this conglomeration of a bunch of systems. Um, but we'll just say there's a, 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 there's a lot of, you know, kind of woo woo, um, you know, knocking around at the edges, especially in the late eighties, early nineties. Um, I heard <laughs> one guy I was, uh, uh, listening to the other day, um, it's this great kind of video documentary about uh, it's called fighting in the age of loneliness, um, which is like a socioeconomic kind of analysis of the mixed martial arts boom. But he said in it, he's like, in the early nineties, people still believed if you punch the right way, you could make a guy's heart explode, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and so there's a lot of that stuff that really is still around the edges when I was coming up as a kid. And, um, I, I immediately, you know, sensed that there was a lot that wasn't true. But as a result of some of that, woo, I got really introduced to meditation and Qigong um, at a very early age. Um, and that, that piece in, predic- in particular, around eight, eight to 10, um, is when I was really starting to be like, huh, so just like sitting and breathing is a part of my training? What's that about? And um, you know, as we'll get to kind of later in the conversation, that really led me to a lot of the esoteric and spiritual underpinnings of martial arts. But my, uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, watching Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball as a kid and and meditating and and studying energy, you know, like what's energy work, um, really became this kind of quiet side pursuit that led me, um, you know, kind of down a lot of roads that uh, brought me to Buddhism and Taoism in particular, uh, around that 12 to 13 age. I read the Tao Te Ching probably for the first time when I was 13. Um, and I became very aware of the, you know, four noble truths and the eightfold noble path, uh, very, uh, right around that age as well. And, um, has influenced my training kind of ever since. Um, and is, I, I, absolutely like without a doubt know that it is the reason that i am the type of person i am now around uh values such as service in particular in martial arts you may be one of uh, as few as two possibly three or four people who have brought up the concepts of service in martial arts together mm-hmm. um I did an episode so called essential. Martial Arts as Service a few years I, ago. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I I would like you to unpack that concept as as it, you know, what is it, what does it mean to you? How does it manifest for you? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, thanks for thanks for picking up on that. You know, I was I was really lucky. Most of my martial arts instructors who I've spent uh, you know a long period of time with were veterans, um, of, you know, various conflicts. Uh, and for that reason, the idea, and, and this is, this is just, you know, it's everywhere in 
the traditional writings on martial arts. So there's tons of precedent for this conversation to be had in, in every single classic that has to do with, uh, you know, the philosophical underpinnings of martial arts. So that, that piece cannot be removed as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the, the martial knight, uh, at the heart of knighthood, right? Uh, samurai or even the Germanic nicht that emerges into the word knight, um, is, to serve is the etymological root of the word. And um, yes, that word can be taken advantage of. Uh, we, can, we can see clearly now with a historical study that the samurai were, you know, just as much, you know, kind of mercenary thugs as they were, you know, kind of virtuous knights. But the mythologies, the stories, the, the, the ideals underpinning it uh, around service, not just to a person, not just to a lord, but to your your people, right? To your ancestors in particular is an extremely important concept. Um, to you know your nation state as we previously understood it, and I would say actually this transcendent understanding of of service. Uh, must kind of lead us to a common humanity now as we know more about the world around us and actually that our separations of borders are kind of somewhat imposed on us. And so we as martial artists, I know that a martial artist from anywhere in the world will have more in common with me than uh, most people, um, even from my own country, uh, who have never studied martial arts where that common respect, that common practice, that common uh, care for one another's growth actually will supersede in so many ways individual cultures. Um, and so for me, service is always expressed through a love of one another, uh, an appreciation and desire to learn from one another, but also uh, I think the thing that all good, you know, teachers understand is true services in the development of the future, right? And children mm. in every way are the, the future of, of the martial arts. And so for me, service has always taken the role of teaching. You know, I've always, like, even since, I don't know, 14, 15 was when I started getting interested in saying, eh, you know, I'm not going to really be like a world-class competitor, but I really do want to teach and I really do want to share this knowledge with uh, people who want to uh, invite it into their lives to enrich themselves. Um, and hopefully, you know, my hope was that uh, they would enrich the world around them by being enriched by these practices. You talked about the idea of having things in common with other martial artists. And it's a concept mm. that comes up frequently on the show. I, I've said quite a bit, we have far more in common with other martial artists than we have that is different. There's more yeah. that binds us than divides us. Lots of different ways you can say it. But I find it yeah. uh, interesting is not quite the right word because it, it, that implies some disrespect. Anybody who's <laughs> familiar with the karate style of Weichi Ru knows that huh. it is kind of different looking uh hi yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. it, it uh i i'm gonna say odd not in a disparaging way but if you were to line up goju and shotokan and ishinru mm -hmm. even ishinru which i consider to look a little bit different aesthetically weichiru is sure. is kind of out there aesthetically concepts totally. are very similar but movements etc when was cool. it that you yeah. started to connect the dots and realize that this thing that I'm rooted in is still much more alike these other things and sure. seeing those commonalities. Sure. sure. No, it's a great question. Well, you know, I mean, the way I always say it uh, to people is two arms, two legs, a head and a torso. So uh, everything's the same underneath itself. And while we all have two arms, two legs, a head and a torso, um, the uh, the functionality of our musculature structure is always going to operate the same. And what I find interesting about martial arts is, and traditional martial arts in particular, is that you can essentially pinpoint what does this system find useful 
around how to functionalize that musculature and what do they specialize in and and what is it that they as a system is uh, or what is it that they as a system are focused on developing in their students Weichiru is only odd if you don't know where it comes from and i think for a lot of reasons the same for a lot of reasons the way karate developed over time during the meiji restoration period is a function of japanese nationalism trying to claim karate for itself from the chinese mainland and weichiru is an interesting karate style because it's the youngest one or one of the youngest ones in the Okinawan islands. Um it came over very specifically from a man and I do have to say the story of this man Kanbun Weichi is very uh formative in my my nomadic tendency, right? He followed actually a pretty archetypal path of Okinawan fishermen who went to China to study and um and live you know he emigrated to China lived there for a decade studied martial arts and chinese medicine for a period of time came back there's some you know there's a lot of uh you know we'll say like mythology around why he came back but for whatever reason he came back and um resist it was very very resistant to teaching uh and when he was teaching um, you know, he was, it was, it was very private as a lot of the, the Okinawans are very private people. They, they very much were able to keep their arts alive by keeping them very private. As we all understand the Japanese, um, you know, kind of, uh, uh, colonialism of Okinawa, right? Okinawa was its own independent nation until Japan, uh, you know, kind of colonized it. And um, it was during that period of time that the Okinawan arts, the, the, the te arts, as they referred to them, you know, kind of had to really go underground in order to survive. And it wasn't until um, the early 1900s that Kitchen Funakoshi uh, was able to popularize the arts by making them seem very useful to the, the, the Meiji um, you know, government, uh, which then, you know, in many ways... Uh, became, you know, a tool of the, the, the Japanese imperial structure for training young men to go to war. And, um, that's a very, you know, it's, it's an essential component of how karate developed because Weichiru did not follow that trajectory. Weichiru comes very specifically from Southern White Crane. And when you look at Sanchin from Weichiru, as opposed to Gojiru, uh, with the fist, as opposed to the open hand in Weichiru, you can see clearly, clearly in that stance, the, uh, the Southern white crane influence. And, uh, for me, that was really what influenced my, my travels to China was, uh, a desire to understand the root of these, these systems that got to China, not, and, and were then, you know, can, Currently developed over hundreds of years, right? Um, but you look at Shotokan in particular, that was developed from uh, Funakoshi Sensei's, uh, you know, Shori Te system that he had learned in secret, secret from his teachers, uh, and then made to be more accessible to high school students and secondary school students so that they could learn the gross motor movements. Uh, and uh, internalize the movements, and then um, be able to apply the movements in you know kind of later sparring uh, competitions and ranking competitions. Uh, all of that was very very late to come into Weichiru, and um, it has a it has a unique history in that way. Um, and especially you mentioned I the the one thing that I really want to speak to. The really unique piece about Weichiru is its very exotic hand forms. Um, you know, it makes very strange 
positions with its with its fingers and with its fists. Sure. Um, and whenever you study uh, traditional Chinese martial arts, you see those fists everywhere. Uh, you know, panther, tiger, all of those things would naturally be taught uh, at a very young age. And actually, you know, it's only now on the other side of 35 that I understand why. And dexterity is extremely important to human survival pre-industrial period. Um, and the other piece about it is that uh, if you study Chinese medicine from the bodywork standpoint, you actually see that a lot of the exotic hand fists that Kumbu Weichi was teaching are actually Twina techniques. They're actually, I believe, tied very specifically to uh, uh, techniques that people would employ to do massage work on uh, people's bodies, uh, acupressure as opposed to acupuncture work, right? Um, and and I'm almost certain that nobody picked up on that until you know. I, I, I'm sure there have got to be a couple people who've studied it since since then, but it was only my apprenticeship with an acupressure um, teacher and a Qigong teacher and a uh, and a Chinese medical teacher that actually really cemented my theory on that piece. That, that sounds like quite the epiphany. Is, is, was, is it as uh, simple yeah. as I might be imagining? <laughs> well, and we're, when we're doing acupressure, you know, we make our hands like this, and you're like, oh my God, that's, I do that in Weichi Room. Like, is, was it that yeah, I, simple? It, it was, I, you know, uh, yeah, probably that simple when I decided it, um, <laughs> you know, like when I, this, you know, young idiot decided, yeah, that's what that is. Uh, no, it was, you know, and it still is a theory that I would never claim to hold over someone who was like a, you know, uh, a high ranking Weichi practitioner who said like, you're, you know, you're completely wrong. You're full of fish. Uh, or a Chinese medical practitioner who's like, no, you're completely wrong. Um, I would never push that theory, but uh, I do have a I do have a sense that Kumbu Weichi was a very humble man who, as I said, was interested both in Chinese medicine and in Chinese martial arts. Um, and because of that, I I, I just anybody who knows the kind of scholar warrior tradition of Chinese martial arts knows that there is actually very little separation in that worldview, right? Actually mm -hmm. to fight is to learn to heal and to learn to heal is to learn to fight. And, especially uh, in Chinese uh, traditions. We, we've heard from a number of guests yes. On, yes. on the show, folks that, who have, you know, learned Kung Fu and they're learning other <clears throat> medical things you know just yes whether it's acupuncture or something else that this this dichotomy that you know one supports the other and one is a responsibility of the I, other yes yes and that uh, that's exactly right and i i could not agree more with that and i think it's it's only my it, it was only my deep curiosity about the the chinese systems that undergirded um the japanese evolution that really kind of brought that forth in me. So, you know, in my mid twenties, I was really, um, yeah, I was really very much kind of coming across these, these things and being like, yeah, that's, that was what that was. Huh. That's so interesting. Okay. Let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. And that was actually what led me to my apprenticeship with, uh, my Chinese, uh, medical practitioner teacher. Um, and I had actually become, you know, uh, I guess I'll throw this in there. Uh, I had been doing Reiki since I was 18, um, and became very interested in the dichotomy of if I'm going to learn to harm, I must learn to heal. And, uh, that became a huge, huge driver of my, you know, we'll say like my broad study over time. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Th this is not the <laughs> typical common there's the word i want to use this is not the common path for someone who trains <laughs> even folks who train at a deep level and and make it the thing the center point <laughs> of their lives <laughs> it seems like if, if we roll back to the beginning this nomadic lifestyle i i <laughs> use the word experimental and what what is an experiment other than an attempt to answer a question? In order to try to answer the question, you have to ask the question, where does this constant drive 
to ask more questions come from? Mm. Mm. <clears throat> Man, if I had the answer to that question, I don't know that I'd ask <laughs> as many questions as I did. Uh, <laughs> or maybe you'd ask far more. Who knows? Yeah, maybe, maybe. You know, and it is funny. I, you know, as I... I think it was when I turned 30 um, and I was leaving my apprenticeships. Actually, that the burning desire to ask more questions kind of began to fade in my, you know, I think by that point, by 30, I had been meditating and studying kind of the spiritual components of martial arts, you know, by that point, we'll just say for 20 years. And I started to, you know, Taoism really has been a guiding factor for me. I started to just feel a willingness to sit with the not knowing and a joy at letting the questions be the cones that they are from Zen, you know, Zen Buddhist term cone, you know, the, that the question actually itself is more important than the answer. And I found myself really just coming back to that truth of two arms, two legs, a head and a torso, two arms, two legs, a head and a torso. And everything that I'm, every answer I was going to find was ultimately a human answer. And so, you know, it was at that time, you know, I know the seeds had been planted all those years before and through my 20s to say like, this is fundamentally a human experience that we're talking about here, a human understanding and relationship to conflict and violence. And (laughs) that is such a complex field of study, you know, and I, I guess my questions, my experimentation had always come from a desire to be able to articulate myself ultimately. Um, I always had kids and adults asking me questions, um, as a teacher, and I always wanted to be able to answer their questions. And I had this internal, you know, maybe we'll say, you know, overly internalized sense, uh, that I had to be able to answer all the questions, right? So I had to be the best question asker in order to be the best question answerer. Um, and you know, even that has kind of fallen away. Even the idea that I have to be the best at anything has really kind of fallen away. And if there's really a thing that feels resonant for me now, it is, you know, that this is this is a function of trying to be the best human I can be. This is trying to be um, nearest, you know, my partner was trained as a counselor and expressive arts therapist and we talk a lot about how ultimately underlying everything, you know, the study of human relationship is the study of conflict. The study of relationship on any level depends on us being able to skillfully and gracefully negotiate conflict. And ideally, you know, for me, and I, I know a lot of people would disagree probably on some level, but the the truest sense of a skillful martial artist in my mind is someone who can negotiate conflict without ever arriving at violence. Can you say and, that again? That's, that's deep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, I, I, I don't know that I can say the exact words, okay. but I'll say, it's okay. I'll say it a different way. No, but I'll say it a different way, which is the hallmark of an extremely skillful practitioner is someone who can negotiate conflict without ever having arrived or ever arriving at violence. And I believe that that requires us, you know, I, I, for a lot of reasons, you know, my teachers were men who were very aware of the truths of human violence inflicted against one another skillfully. And arriving at violence to me is effectively the, the, in, if you study the legalistic definitions of continuum of force, right, arriving at violence is the last steps in 
the continuum of violence. You know, first, we have to be able to say, like, can I be mutually beneficial first? <laughs> you know, can I add value to someone else's life? And then if we arrive at, at a conflict, can I mediate that conflict effectively? If I can't mediate that conflict effectively, can I empathize with what this person might actually be saying underneath the conflict? Can I negotiate back to mutual benefit or are we going to continue to descend toward violence? Not using violence as my, my end all be all, or even, I mean, God forbid my first option when there's conflict. Um, and that really, I, you know, without, we were having a great conversation, so I don't mean to, you know, kind of deviate from our, our okay. direction here. Yeah. But, you know, for me, actually, the, the study of and the teaching of self-defense in particular um, to uh, women and children, but honestly, the, the more I've studied it to, to everyone, everyone in our current uh, cultural context has a lot of trouble with and around violence. And I think understanding violence, not as something that is just a punch and a kick, but actually everything else that leads up to the violence, the way we speak to each other, the way we hold our bodies in front of each other, the way that we um, orient ourselves to relationship is actually what leads to violence. And violence um, is something that should be and can be skillfully engaged with. But if we're not engaging with the other pieces skillfully, I think we're fundamentally missing the point of all of it, which is a more harmonious uh, interaction with one another. I, I'm right there with you. You know, yeah. one of the things that I've, I've long criticized our industry, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. is that we teach self-defense as starting at the point of the initiation of violence. When oh, in so true all but very rare cases, there are things that happen ahead of that. And in yes. order to get to the point of violence, you have to mess up. You have to handle it wrong. Are there, are there <laughs> cases exactly where someone right. comes out of left field <laughs> with intent that they just want to hurt you? Yes, but statistically, that is the minority. Statistically so speaking, that's exactly right. Yes, we are yes. the de-escalation techniques. I teach yes. them when I teach self-defense. I suspect you Good do. You. And we probably have quite a few people listening who do because, you know, our audience does skew a little bit more towards this thoughtful perspective. But mm. we are the minority in our industry. Mm. Mm -hmm. One of the things mm -hmm. I am, and you know, I, I told you before we, we rolled, I was going to say very little about me, but here's something that, that I will say, and I'm very proud of mm. this. I've never been in a real fight. I have mm. managed to walk it down every single time, including being around friends who were constantly in fights, that they would start to bubble up. And I was able to bring everything back. Work your way down. Because I think that is the only way where you win, I'm using air quotes, a fight, yeah. is when it doesn't happen. And what, what's the, yeah. the Mr. Miyagi <laughs> quote? Best not fight if fight win, something like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So no, let's that's exactly not fight. Right. <laughs> Yeah, let's not fight and let's understand why the fight is going to happen. And actually, I talk to some of my students a lot these days, like, you know, about uh, it, during my apprenticeships, I became very interested in primatology as the undergirding understanding of the way humans are going to interact, right? Because we're, we're fundamentally just great apes with nice clothes. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's, uh, we separate ourselves out, right? And we like to mystify a lot of this stuff. We like to make it all seem like it's, it's so much more complex than it actually is. Um, and I, I tell my students a lot, if you're using what I'm teaching you right now, you, you did everything else wrong. And, powerful um, statement. yeah, it is a powerful statement. And most people look at me like I, you know, I have three heads when I say it. So I, you know, I have a lot of empathy for like, Hey man, I, I, I came here to learn how to fight. Like I didn't come here to like learn how to talk. Um, and, and I, as you say, I mean, I'm happy to hear that I'm in good company around criticizing our industry. Um, because I would say that a lot of the reason that I went on, you know, I guess I'll, I'll backtrack in our conversation around why was I so obsessed with finding some of the answers to these questions was because honestly, everywhere around me that I looked, there was nobody asking those questions. 
there was nobody, you know, there were people saying like, how do I get, how do I retain more students? How do I get more students into the door? How do I, you know, what, what's the next hot program that I can bring in? Is it Krav Maga this month? Is it Brazilian Jiu Jitsu next month? Is it this? Is it that? Don't get me wrong. I've studied all those things and I enjoy all those things. And actually, you know, my primary study for myself right now is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, because, uh, I just have a blast rolling around on the floor. Um, always have, you know, uh, yeah, it is good times. And, uh, and there's a reason that the U S military, you know, uses that as one of their primary combatives tools. Um, and the way that we approach violence is such, a it feels like a cowboy mentality, right? It's, uh, um, one of my teachers was talking with with their teacher in Japan, and uh, you know the cultural mythologies that that get tied into the martial arts is so interesting, right? Um, in Japan, obviously, there's these like various cultural relics. The samurai is a great example of a cultural relic, right? But uh, as I said to one of my, uh, it was like someone who taught at my school for a period of time. You know, essentially, this is just Neo-Confucian cosplay, right? We're all dressing up in funny pajamas that come from a bygone era so that we can, you know, kind of make a gentle nod to another culture, right? It's uh, it's all good. But in America, we have very different cultural signifiers. In America, we are actually a much more violent uh, culture. Um, you know, uh, all we have to do is look at uh, the gun violence, um, you know, components of our of our country to say, yeah, we kind of have this like cowboy thing. Everybody gets a gun. And if it really comes down to it, we just, you know, I'll see you at noon on the street and let's shoot it out. Um, you know, really becomes this like kind of cultural signifier and underlying mythological framework for understanding violence. Um for a lot of reasons, that's just kind of ingrained in our population. Um, and when it does come to a study of violence, and we're talking deep violence, as one of my collaborators likes to mention, right? Like we're really looking at deep, deep violence. Yeah, okay. It's 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 dirty. You know, we're not going to get into a fight. I'm going to go home. I'm going to get my gun. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to win the fight. Um. But when it comes to kind of ceremonial violence, when it comes to the idea of, of sparring, meeting in training, meeting in this mutual rate, as I mentioned, right? Uh, all martial arts begins and ends with respect. Uh, there's a very different set of rules that are applied to the interaction. Um, and the the exchange, the transaction itself is very different because the premium is not placed on who can beat the crap out of who necessarily. It is actually, you know, especially in training environments, the premium is placed on learning, right? The premium is placed on how much did I learn from that uh, interaction, not did I beat the crap out of that person as well as I possibly could. And I, you know, I don't come across many dojos that are, uh, you know, just beating crap out of each other. Um, you know, <laughs> at least not publicly. Uh, yeah, at least not publicly. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And uh, a lot of a lot of the beating the crap out of people actually is is largely emotional that I've ever come across. Um, you know, making sure that people don't feel comfortable. You know, finding other teachers or finding other ways or you know whatever, whatever. Um, because of this kind of desire to make sure that people are sticking in that school, in that system, not questioning too much, not, you know, not going outside of the box too far. Because I think once we really go out of the box, I think a lot of our conversation is really where we start to come up against the truth, right? Which is that this is a human endeavor. This is a, this is a, this is an endeavor as old as time. Um, you know, people have been killing each other for as long as we've been around. And I certainly am not the greatest combatant to ever live and never will be. That's not, that's never going to be my way. Um, that's not going to be my karma. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, our industry has had to kind of feed on those cultural myth, uh, those cultural mythologies, right? They've had to really build the idea of 
oh yeah, you know, people who are afraid are actually going to come and take lessons a lot more than people who are not afraid. And there's a, there's a way to capitalize on people's fear. And if I make it about just violence, then me, the big strong man at the front of the room is always going to be the one that the, the little person in the back of the room is going to look to for answers. And if he's coming to me looking for answers, then I'm going to make sure that he is going to keep paying monthly to make sure that I give him those answers. And. It's a, it's, it's a real chicken egg situation around a lot of the way that we engage with violence as a culture. Um, it's really led me to question a lot of the way we do things. And I know, you know, um, I have nothing to plug in this interview, but I know, uh, as I look to my next iterations and evolutions as a teacher, um, most of what I'm interested in teaching is about the transformative power of conflict in people's lives and changing our relationship to conflict, changing our relationship to ourselves in conflict with others as not this is a, a thing to be avoided, but actually this is a thing to be uh, embraced and welcomed in so that we might be more skillful practitioners uh, okay. in that. Yeah. I, I'm going to ask a question in a different way than I think I've ever asked it before, but it feels appropriate. Amazing. If you ask most people, you know, how would you classify one martial artist as being better than another martial artist? The general mm. population is going to equate that to fighting. Oh, well, if mm. that person can beat up that person, they're a better martial artist. Mm. There is a percentage, I don't know how large it is, within our industry of martial artists, people listening to the show, etc., who, if you said, what makes one martial artist better than another, would likely go to that, not just because they believe it, but because it's such a difficult and subjective question that how sure. else do you really rank someone? Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to ask you that question. If yeah. you were to compare martial artists and, and look for a way to determine this martial artist is better than mm. this martial artist, what mm. would your methodology rubric whatever fancy academic word you want to come up with here mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. be in that evaluation mm, that's a great question um <laughs> well i'll cop out of the question or answering the question first you know like all, sure. all good all good teachers and say uh you know actually i really like this one scene in uh, the Jet Li movie, Fearless, right? And the, the Japanese martial artist and him are sitting down and drinking tea. And uh, the Japanese martial artist is is mentioning that the tea they're drinking is the best tea, you know, you can find. And uh, Jet Li's character, who is based on a, a true, a real person, um, you know, says, uh, you know, it's all just tea, right? So there's no, there's no need to rank it next to it, to itself, you know? So, uh, you know, I would, I personally would, um, the word sensei does not mean teacher. The word sensei means one who has gone before, right? We're all on the same road. There's no better. There's no worse. It's just a path that we're all walking. Those, there might be some who have who started the path before us, and there will definitely be others who start the path after us. And it is actually our continuum. It is our line of practice that is most important. That said, um, while that is my personal answer, I think the most important thing to always remember is what uh, rule set are we talking about? Better how? Are we talking about uh, a submission game or are we talking about a knockout game? Are we talking about a position game or are we talking about, um, you know, uh, just a sheer, uh, you know, violence game? What's, what's, what's really being asked of the athlete in the moment? Uh, for me, one of the, the most important things is adaptability across rule sets. Um, adaptability and flexibility for me as like a human species, it's actually like one of those things that separates us actually from the vast majority of of, of creatures is, is our adaptability to many different circumstances and situations. Um, 
And so, uh, yeah, like a supple flexibility across rule sets um, is something that I've always endeavored to make sure that my students have is that you should never be saying like, oh, this this way of practicing is better than that way of practicing. It's actually like, I've always really wanted to pass on to my students, like, how do I appreciate every way of practicing um, so that I can practice with everyone? And uh, that piece for me really comes down to like, my personal preference around teaching, of course, you know, so uh, that's maybe my second way of answering the question. Um, and then when it does come down to the, the raw brute force answering of the question, who can beat the fish out of who? I understand why that question is so appealing. I understand why there's just like, people have always watched gladiatorial bouts. People have always just had this obsession with who's the biggest ape on the block. And um, I can understand why, you know, I was a 15 year old kid once too. And I was curious and watching, you know, who, who could beat up who. I remember, you know, uh, I grew up also in the time of MMA, right? And so like, we've really, in a lot of ways, had a chance to answer those questions a lot over the last 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, you know, watching these different styles and practitioners fight each other um, pretty, pretty violently, you know, with, with very little limitation on what they can do to each other. Um. And I think what we're really finding is that this, this horrible realization comes true is that there's always going to be somebody who's got your number. And the, even the best martial artists in the world can get knocked out given the right sets of circumstances, right? So um, real violence is always unpredictable. Real violence actually doesn't always favor the person who's most prepared or most trained, right? Real violence actually favors uh, <laughs> circumstantial, you know, or happenstance sort of events. Um, and so in that way, you know, I think a lot of martial artists have sought to hide behind rule sets um, and to pick the rule sets that suits their strengths the best um, as a way of, of appearing the strongest. Um, and so, yeah, you know, uh, uh, that was a long way of not answering your question directly, but I, I really but, appreciate but she answered yeah, it. I heard it. Yeah, I did. There's yeah, an totally. answer in there. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. There's a few of them. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. And, and I always will appreciate the question and I'll always, I, you know, I, I watch fights to this day. Uh, and I love watching it. I love watching the evolution of our art. I love watching the evolution of martial arts, uh, through this this time in this place in human in human history, um, it is extraordinarily interesting to watch the way that fighters are evolving right now. Um, and I, I personally, you know, as someone with lots of critiques for the martial arts industry, continue to be interested in uh, always learning better and better ways of practicing and teaching and working. Uh, to understand and master skillful use of violence. Right on. Well, wow. good stuff. That's a that's a great place to start winding down some mm, deep subjects. Yeah, and yeah. if and if we open the door on more, it's it's going to go even deeper. And I, wanna... I know. It's, yeah, one of the. I, <laughs> we'll, I, we'll have I, to have you yeah. back for for more of a, uh, a subject discussion. Oh, that would be that would be a blast. I you know I just got to say I you know I really appreciate your thoughtful questions. And uh, I really appreciate the, the discussion and the opportunity to discuss sure. with you. Sure. Thanks, for, yeah. thanks for coming on. If people want to get a hold of you, you know, are there websites or social media that, that you can share? Uh, yeah, you know, um, right now I actually am getting, I'm working on getting off social media uh, for a little bit. Um, I, up until 2019, was operating a school in Southern Vermont called Sangha Martial Arts, which I... Uh, thankfully closed right before kind of COVID all started um, and relocating back to the Massachusetts area. So I'm on Instagram as uh, embodied mystery uh, where I hope to be posting a lot more of my current practice, which is uh, around reclaiming the human body as uh, a tool of expression, um, animal movement and martial arts and dance all kind of mixed together. 
And uh, I have a website, which is actually more focused on my service aspects uh, that I wasn't sure if I was going to share, but I, I think I will share. Uh, it's called uh, wanderingministry.org. Um, and that is uh, more focused on my interfaith uh, practice as a uh, spiritual practitioner. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll, I'm sure I will one day have something more focused on martial arts, but for right now, uh, that is, that's where my mind is uh, kind of leading me. So oh, nice. All right. Well, thanks yeah. for sharing that. And of course we'll, we'll get that into the show notes at, yeah, over no on the website. Yeah. Yeah. And this is where we start to close up. So I'm going to ask totally. you, how do you want to send us out to the outro that I'm going to record later? Final words, motivational thoughts, you know, something, something like that. Your, your final words to the listeners today. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you know, if there's especially, you know, younger students who are are looking to you know, embrace martial arts as a path, um, you know, my the thing I would say to any practitioner though is you know, continue to follow your curiosity, continue to follow where the work leads you and uh do not <laughs> let anybody's explanations deter you in your constant questioning of what is real and what is true. One of the common themes on this show is asking the question, why? And when you work backwards from why, it often leaves the opportunity to add and change and implement new things to keep that white belt mentality that we talk about. Well, I, I think today's guest exemplified that. And I think that that's why I had not only so much fun talking to him, but hearing what it was he said. I, I heard a lot of my own thoughts echoed, but as you might expect, as I always hope for, just enough that's different, either articulated differently or expressed in a, a way that makes me think. And that's my favorite thing about this show. So I got some good stuff out of it. I hope you got great stuff out of it. And Mr. Hoffman, thank you, Matt. I appreciate you coming on the show. I hope you got something out of it as well. Listeners, you can go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com to see the show notes, videos, links, social media, pictures, you know, not just for this episode, but all the episodes that we do. Don't forget, they're all there. We have, at this point, somewhere around 700 hours, maybe more, of content for you to check out just in audio form. And it's all for free. And if you want to support that, keep us going. You've got lots of options. You could share this episode with somebody. You could leave a review somewhere. You could tell a friend or contribute to our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And remember, if you're looking for the ideal strength and conditioning program made for martial artists, well, I made it and you can get it at whistlekickprograms.com. That's a newer website. You can still get it at whistlekick.com, but we made a new program website for strength and speed and fight conditioning and all the ones that are in development. And if you want to grab that program, or something else, use code PODCAST15. It's going to save you 15%, and it helps connect the dots for us on the back end. We'd love to hear your guest suggestions. So you can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com, and our social media, don't forget, we put a lot into it. It's at whistlekick everywhere you can imagine. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 